And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Maynard Orm, who is the Executive Director of Oregon Public Broadcasting, and he will introduce our uh, guest this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Terry. After I get through with you, you'll feel like you've just been through the opening credits on a new public television series. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to all of you refugees from American League Championship Baseball, you space explorers and Earth travelers, fellow citizens of the planet Earth. On behalf of Oregon Public Broadcasting, I want to welcome you all here tonight to this unique event. This is a special moment. A U.S. astronaut and a Soviet cosmonaut have come together to speak in unison about the state of the Earth and the future that space represents. Their joint presence is a testimony to the fact that some concerns are more than just national problems, and the most powerful visions are greater than national perspectives. The vision of Earth and space, so beautiful yet so fragile and so in need of cherishing, has forged a bond between these and all the astronauts and cosmonauts from all the nations who have seen their home planet from the vastness of space. Many of those space travelers have formally united in an organization called the Association of Space Explorers to promote the cooperative exploration and development of space and the use of space technology for human benefit. It is an organization which operates independently of NASA and the Soviet government and independently of any of the governments of the 20 countries which to date have sent people into space. We are privileged here tonight to have the founder of this remarkable international group and its current president, Rusty Schweiker. Mr. Schweiker, a former fighter pilot, was destined for a space flight as he was born in 1935 in Neptune, New Jersey. He was a research scientist at the Experimental Astronomy, uh, Astronomy Laboratory at MIT before he came to NASA as one of 14 astronauts named in 1963. In 1969, he orbited Earth for nine days and served as lunar module pilot for Apollo 9. During this mission, he conducted hazardous tests of the portable life support backpack which was later used during exploration of the moon's surface. In 1973, he served as backup commander for the first Skylab mission. In that role, he averted imminent disaster. After the Skylab vehicle lost its shield during launch, he took charge of erecting an emergency solar shade. I think most of you are old enough to remember that. After leaving NASA, Mr. Schweikert served as California Governor Jerry Brown's assistant for science and technology, and then went on to serve for five and a half years as the Commissioner of Energy for the state of California. Later in 1987 and 88, he chaired the U.S. Antarctic Program Safety Review Panel. His top-level comprehensive report, Safety in Antarctica, left the entire program being restructured for greater safety. Mr. Schweiker continues to work as a lecturer and consultant in international relations and communications and has coordinated several projects in the Soviet Union as well as other countries. We are proud and privileged to have him here tonight. His fellow speaker, Colonel Yuri Romanenko, is equally distinguished. Mr. Schweiker will introduce his Soviet colleague in a little while, but first let me say that Mr. Romanenko was born in 1944 in Koltobanovsky, located in the middle Volta region. He began his cosmonaut training in 1969 and was backup commander of the Apollo Soyuz mission in 1975. He has received the distinguished title and hero of the Soviet Union and the Order of Lenin both two times. His wife, Albertina Ivanovna, is a high school music teacher. And he has two sons, Toman and Arte. He is the person who has spent the most time in space, a total of 430 days. Your program, by the way, is incorrect in that regard. After the presentations, there will be a question and answer period, and we request you to use the microphone set up on the floor. We want to welcome Mr. Schweiker and Mr. Romanenko, who is the most welcome guest in our country and our city. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Rusty Schweiker. Pleasure to be here with Portland basketball and football fans this evening. We uh, we have been touring, uh, or at least Yuri Romanenko has been touring the United States, and uh, we'll go from here on a rather whirlwind schedule. I've joined him here in the Pacific Northwest uh, for talks in Seattle and this evening here in Portland. 
I wanted to say just a couple of words before we get into the major part of the program uh, to give you a bit of background. The Association of Space Explorers is uh, the professional organization, international organization of astronauts and cosmonauts, which we began formally in 1985. Uh, about 35% or so of all of the men and women who have been in space now are members of this organization. We have a total of 72 astronaut and cosmonaut members from 17 different countries. Many people don't realize that, that people from 20 different nations have now flown in space, either on the U.S. program or the, or the Soviet program. Uh, but space has been intrinsically international um, to the credit, I would say, of both the U.S. and Soviet Union. Uh, the Association of Space Explorers, uh, among several other purposes, has um, two things which bring us here. We, we wanted to, in every way we can, promote cooperation between nations in the exploration and development of space and the use of space technology for human benefit. And so we publicly advocate uh, this kind of international cooperation in this intrinsically international or planetary uh, environment. And so that's, uh, that's one thing that brings us here, but also the few of us who have been in space, 210, plus or minus one or two, I can never count, right? But about 210 people now have been in space. And for each of us who has been there, this has been a tremendous gift from the public. Uh, and there's, there's a feeling among us that, that it's difficult to give this back. And so this is part of our purpose. We, we do this in several ways. Uh, one way, last year, uh, The Home Planet, our, our first book, was published, and I hope many of you have already seen it. For those of you who have not, I certainly invite you to take a look in your, in your bookstore for it. It's a completely non-technical book. The best photographs that have been taken, uh, either from U.S. or Soviet uh, spacecraft, and also, and, and I think in some ways more important, the thoughts and feelings of astronauts and cosmonauts from 18 different countries, um, of that personal experience, the thoughts and feelings that they had flying around this beautiful planet of ours. It's dedicated uh, to the home planet, to the planet Earth, which was the theme of our founding Congress and our first award winner, Jacques Cousteau, uh, has a forward, uh, did the forward. In the with, those back, with that background, excuse me, I, I wanted to do one further thing to set the stage here uh, for our talks. And that is that when one has flown in space, one is always asked, what was it like? And that's such a difficult question to answer. Uh, I've tried many ways, but there's very little common experience I can call on to describe or give you the feeling of weightlessness. Uh, the beauty of the Earth, uh, I think, is easier to, to tell people about. But uh, what I want to do here is take you on a, on a brief space trip to start off this evening. Now, when one hears about or reads about or sees on television astronauts and cosmonauts, there is a sense that these are very special people, that they're, they're not normal people, they're off somewhere uh, that you or I could never be. And one of the things I want you to understand is that, is that you're talking about your neighbor. You're talking about the kid down the block who somehow graduated from college and now he's flying in space. I mean, that's, I'm a, I'm a kid from a farm in New Jersey. Um, and so one of the things I want to do is to get you to understand that, that we're talking real people here. This experience of spaceflight was experienced by ordinary people, like me and like Yuri. And you'll get to know us a little better as the evening goes on. So when you see this, uh, these slides, which I'll show you, um, I want you not to watch them as something out there, but I'd like you to realize that you're being watched 
here, you're experiencing this, and what we see here are people, human beings, men and women, looking at this beautiful planet of ours. So join me on the space here.
So I want to welcome you back to Earth. Thanks uh, for coming along on the trip. Um, you know, you go around this whole planet, you understand that people are all one. We're all related. We're brothers and sisters. And I'd like to, at this point, take this opportunity um, to introduce to you one of my Soviet colleagues who has become a very close friend. This particular Soviet cosmonaut has not only flown more time in space than anyone else, 430 days, as was mentioned earlier, but until last December, he held the single longest flight record of 326 days continuously in space. Last December, that was exceeded by two of our friends, Minarov and Titov, who spent one year in space. So uh, at this point, without further ado, let me introduce your brother and mine, Yuri Romanenko. show you some slides. This is the start of our old and reliable rocket, which has launched 76 crews of the Soviet cosmonauts into space. Now, we start and let it go. In accordance with the long term program of exploration and peaceful uses in outer space, the Soviet Union systematically implements plans of integrated utilization of space technology to fulfill national, economic, and scientific. The main spaceflight programs involve the following main directions of exploration. Space technology, exploration of the Earth's resources and environment, biomedical experiments, exploration of psychophysiological activity of man in space, repair, preventive maintenance and assembly operations in space. The technological experiments performed in space made it possible to clarify the problem of crystal growth and the mechanism of materials processing. It is proven feasible to obtain in space monocrystals of such semiconductor materials as gallium arsenide, zinc oxide, cadmium sulfide, and so on. Unique superpure matters were obtained, which are used in pharmacology, agriculture, food industry, as well as 
in bioorganic chemistry, molecular biology, genetic engineering. Of these experiments became incentive for foreign companies to sign contracts for obtain protein preparations on board the Mir space station. This is the space station Mir in flight. With the spacecraft Soyuz much attachment to the docking system. A sizable part of the orbital complex flight programs is devoted to remote sensing of the Earth, exploration of the Earth resources and environment from space involves a great number of problems. By performing the programs of exploration of the Earth, the crews of the orbital stations photograph its surface in various spectral bands by means of peaks and handheld cameras. Space photography materials are used in geological, geological perspective glaciology, water resources management, fishing industry, forestry, agriculture, weather forecast, geography, and cartography. By means of a new video spectral complex, to be installed on board the Mir station in 1989, it's planned to establish a permanent ecological control service. And now you can see the medicine doctor Polakov during the long mission in space study, studies the blood. Is an onion grown in space inside the space station 77. This is Alek Atko, the doctor with the Indian cosmonauts Sharma. They performance the medical experiment. The results of medical research permit us to forecast the possibility of accomplishing longer and longer space flights, including flights to Mars, all based upon the procedures and means of real life, health and performance support, which were first developed in the USSR and have no analogs in world practice. Sufficiently deep studies have been made of the flight factors which affect the physiological and mental state of man and his ability to work in weightlessness under, under conditions of hyperdynamia, limited space and long-term solitude. Procedures and means have been developed to prepare the organism of man for flight. Training sessions in water weather school, the centrifuge and altitude chamber, weightlessness flights in the laboratory aircraft. Means have been, been developed to help maintain ability of men to work during space flight means for physical exercise on board the spacecraft, a trade mill and a bicycle machine to render psychological protection, psychological support and psychological corrections of the crew's mental state. This is me training on the bicycle. Bicycle machine.
on board Mir Station. Spacesuits of two types can be developed for protection of men in the re-entry vehicle during the launching to orbit and during the descent of the Earth as well as during extravehicular activity. The experience of uh, long-term flights of the Soviet cosmonauts has shown the practical feasibility of man-to-man's flight to Mars with modern means of life and performance support. In this respect, the experience of long-term flights gained in the Soviet Union is of undoubted interest for international cooperation in implementation of large-scale international space programs. The Mir station has been in orbit the exit in excess of three years to maintain reliable functioning of an onboard equipment, scientific instruments, photo and cinema ca cameras, and so on, the crews devote a part of their flight time to preventive maintenance, routine repairs of technical facilities, as well as to minor, one can say, domestic repairs. The latter is due to long duration, 900 days of cosmonauts stay on board the station. The Soviet cosmonauts have gained vast experience, experience in performance of preventive maintenance and operations for assembly of rigid structures. On this slide, you can see our crew. Flight engineer Alexander Lavekin, that flown with me about uh, 170 days, and me changing the batteries of the electric equipment of Mir Station. This is a Soyuz 7 space station, space laboratory. The crew commanded by Vladimir Lyakov have for the first time performed operation to install additional panels of the solar cell batteries in order to increase their power. This is the main panel, it's also the main panel, and there is an additional solar panel. Now I would like to show you this slide. You can see Svetlana Savitska, the second Soviet woman cosmonaut, welding in space. In her hand there is a gun. But don't try to find this gun in catalogs. It's a twin electronic beam gun for welding, cutting and spraying metal in space. One of the beams focuses on a spot of two millimeters in diameter and depending on the power level can be used for cutting or welding. A 
Секрю команда Джани Пеков Владимир. He was in space five times. And now he performs an experience, experience with the navigation equipment. This is a picture of a flight engineer Victor Savinik prepared the navigation equipment. The crew, Jenny Becker and Savini, in fact, reanimated the Salute 7 station in summer of 1985 when the station control failed because of a short circuit in the unit of command radio line. And this is Mir station. You can see the solar panel. Docking system. The main module. This is transfer module from the spacecraft Soyuz and this is International Space Laboratory 1 and this is the spacecraft Soyuz on board this station I worked 326 days and my colleagues Titov and Manarov work in space a whole year. An important element of the my flight program was the erection of the third panel of the solar cell battery performed by our crew in the course of extravehicular activities. It resulted in a significant increase of the space complex power supply and permitted to expand the program of scientific researches. Now in our country, in the process of perestroika, a great deal of attention is being paid to the question of expediency to implement large-scale space programs. We believe that all results of space research, as well as the technical breakthroughs achieved in the process of development and creation of space technology, should be widely applied in all branches of the national economy. This creates the necessary prerequisites for more and more wide international cooperation in space. Agreements for participation of foreign cosmonauts in our international programs of space exploration have been made with Japan, Great Britain and Austria. Cooperation with French Friends also be, will be continued. The astronauts and cosmonauts of the Association of Space Explorers look forward to expanded international cooperation in space between all countries. And now I'm going to show you some pictures. Look at them.
Pai, eu não tenho. É que sim, eu não tenho que na minha despreciação. É que eu te tiro de novo. Ou, nada de que na minha despreciação. E sim, não tenho que te dar novo. Eu admiro de continentes. Oceans, forests, mountains, cities and groves, and we absolutely don't see the borders between countries and nations. The time has come. because he's a good friend, but because of his courage, which dramatically exceeds mine in speaking uh, this evening in English, um, that's, that takes uh, a lot of courage, and Yuri's English is better than he thinks it is. Uh, later on, we'll be uh, answering questions and having discussions, and at that time, we'll bring in an interpreter so that we can answer in more detailed ways. I wanted to make a few comments before we move into the Q&A session. Things which are, in some sense, the impressions of astronauts and cosmonauts, rather than some of the uh, accomplishments and the technologies which come out of space development. I said earlier that the question which astronauts and cosmonauts are asked most often was, what was it like? What is that experience? And there are really two major features of the experience of flying in space which stay with you, even as in my case, after 20 years of being back here on the planet. One of them is weightlessness, and the other is the view out the window. I mentioned earlier that weightlessness is very challenging because there's not much that can be called on in common experience to point to as an analog. So rather than use uh, descriptive words, uh, I thought I might use the next best step, which is a, a poem. And this is a very special poem that was written by Dr. Joe Kerwin, who was one of the three astronauts on the first Skylab mission. Um, Joe and his wife, Lee, had a tradition within the family that whenever the other had a birthday, uh, the gift, the traditional gift, was a, was a poem, a new poem that would be composed by the spouse. And as it happened, during Joe's flight on Skylab, which lasted for one month, three weeks into that month, Lee's birthday occurred. And so Joe wrote his wife Lee a poem from space that gives you some idea of, I wouldn't call it the mystery, but a bit of the, of the awe and the wonder of weightlessness. Joe said, we're getting used to knowing how to fly. When I was young, I used to dream in, in ways up so high, I used to fly, excuse me, in dreams up, up ways so high and easy that it seemed as if earth wheeled and slanted and not I. Now we move that way at will like dust boats in a sunbeam, push away, drift down your own trajectory, tumble, play, and who can say which moves and which is still? In this high sunlit ship, the laws of space, height without vertigo, mass without weight, train our nerve waves in their easy pace as if this rhythm were our native state. 
What if man were an exile from the sky, and we perhaps remembering how to fly? I love that last line. I'll pass on your applause to Joe Kerr, I think he deserves it. Um, it. It is very interesting to experience weightlessness because you you don't you have no idea what freedom in three dimensions is like until you're weightless, not just for a moment jumping off a diving board or something of that kind but when you're continuously falling around the earth, hour after hour, day after day, and everything that you put next to you is falling, you just let go of it, and it stays right there with you. Everything floats together in space. That is very handy when it comes to moving around big pieces of equipment. It's not quite as handy when you're trying to drink or handle liquids. They tend to just float around in the air out of the glass or whatever it is. And so you don't have a glass, you have a plastic bag with everything in it, all liquids. And liquids, of course, come in many different forms and types, and I won't go into details, but they are challenging to handle and control. <laughs> the other experience, uh, that stays with you, as I mentioned, is the view out the window. And this is a bit easier to share because we can take photographs. I would only hasten to say that what you see in photographs here of the space experience is a bit like the photographs you took on your last family vacation and you show them at home and everybody looks at you and wonders why you're so excited about it. Um, the reality, of course, is, is just far more spectacular and, and obviously much more personal. Um, in my own case, the experience reached a peak when I went outside the spacecraft on an EBA, as Yuri mentioned, or an extravehicular activity, or in common parlance, a spacewalk. And at that point, you're no longer inside looking out through a window, but you're out there truly floating in space as a single human being floating inside a spacesuit, but without any restriction to your to your vision. There aren't any frame frames around what it is you're seeing. Your head's in a goldfish bowl. And so there you are, flying over the Earth at 17,000 miles an hour with this incredibly beautiful planet below a very thin, iridescent blue band at the horizon, and then the darkest, blackest sky you've ever seen above. Infinite depth and infinitely black, whatever that means, but it's very real. And of course what strikes you is are, are those two things down below, that iridescent blue band, that brilliant blue, thin band all around the horizon is the entire atmosphere which sustains life all compressed right on the surface of the earth. And of course you're above it and so you see it only as a thin line at the horizon. And then of course down below that you're seeing the surface of the earth directly and it's one of the most spectacular and beautiful experiences that anyone can have. And of course you see I showed in, in early space trip we took a couple of sunrises and sunsets. You see 16 sunrises and sunsets every day that you're in orbit. Now that's, you, you know, that gets to you after a while, Pete. Uh, almost, no matter who you are. Not quite, but almost. The, the, the beauty of the Earth, of course, is not the only thing that you begin that you see. What you what you begin to realize, especially when you look out the other way, you see this, as Lauren Atkins said, you see the majesty and the grandeur of space, of deep space. But no welcome. It's impersonal. When you look at the earth, on the other hand, you see life, teeming life. The whole place is filled with living things. We're talking here, then, about a living entity that we call planet Earth. 
But it is not only living, it is also fragile. And it is very, very precious. And of course, when you fly around the whole thing day after day, your identity begins to shift. Sultan al Saud, the Saudi Arabian astronaut who flew on the space shuttle, said it best, I think. He said, the first day or two we looked at our countries. By the second and third day, we were pointing to our continents. On the fifth day, all we could see was one Earth. And that's a wonderful description of that transition that takes place. Because you start looking for what's familiar, and the next thing you know, the whole planet becomes familiar, and the identity shifts. Another Another way of stating it, I think, another example of the personal nature of this experience, and that's what I'm talking about now. I want to later shift, I think, into what I consider the implications of this for the future of, of the Earth and for life on Earth. But in terms of this experience, Sasha Alexandrov, one of the Soviet cosmonauts, who is a very good friend, was flying on one of the long-duration Soviet missions, and toward the end of his flight, uh, which was uh, now shifting into winter, Sasha wrote the following. He said, one morning I woke up and decided to look out the window to see where we were. We were flying over America, and suddenly I saw snow, the first snow we ever saw from orbit, light and powdery, it blended with the contours of the land, with the veins of the rivers. I thought, autumn, snow. People are busy getting ready for winter. A few minutes later, we were flying over the Atlantic, then Europe, and then Russia. I've never visited America, but I imagine that the arrival of autumn and winter is the same there as in other places, and the process of getting ready for them the same. And then it struck me that we're all children of our Earth. It does not matter what country you look at, we are all Earth's children, and we should treat her as our mother. If I were to identify the two most important things that we have gotten from spaceflight, it would not be the traditional benefits of communications, global communications, weather forecasting, earth observations, growing crystals and new material, developing new materials, all these things are real and important benefits, and I in no way want to belittle them. But I think even more important are the two things, are two things. One, we've learned that we live on a huge, highly integrated living system, this planet Earth, our biosphere, which supports us. And it's the only home of life that we know of in the whole universe. It supports all life that we know. And secondly, we see in looking at this planet, and in fact, we finally know that the behavior of humankind is now posing serious challenges to the future viability of this very system living system that supports us. I can't think of any, any more important lesson that we've learned from looking at the Earth from space. Now, we can learn that lesson, perhaps, by looking at our feet. In fact, it's there. But often, when one stands back from something, one sees it differently. And I think that that's the contribution that has been made. We all know this now. Now, what do we conclude as a result of knowing that? Well, one thing, certainly we need to know more. That is, we need to understand how this living system on which, of which we are a part and upon which we depend actually works. And secondly, after getting a better understanding of how this whole thing works, hopefully, we will change or modify our behavior or shape our behavior, we human beings, in such a way that, we, that our activity here on the planet is more consistent with the natural systems which necessarily support us. Now this is not in any way a rejection of technology because I believe it's only through technology that we will be able to sustain life 
here on the planet in a harmonious way. So space technology then is a, one of the primary tools which I think we must use now to better understand our home planet and to better enable us to shape our own behavior consistent with the nature of that environment. One of the other important things that I think we have to learn, however, is not simply learning about the Earth, but as often happens when one's perspective shifts, especially when it enlarges, when one goes from one's hometown to the big city for the first time, when one gets older and has perhaps even lived in the big city for a while and then goes overseas for the first time, each one of these shifts into a larger environment causes us to look back and to gain a bit in our perspective. We see our life as it was in a different way. We see it in a larger context. It's still valid. It's still important. That's family at home and friends. But we see it in a larger context. And I think in some sense this is part of what we are now beginning to learn from this space experience. We are beginning not only to understand the Earth, but we're beginning to understand ourselves a bit better, at least I hope so. And one of the things which I mentioned earlier that's so important is that space by its nature is international. It is planetary. You can't hover. You can't stay in one place. You circle the entire Earth. And so we see the, the entire planet, and part of the experience that we are sharing here is that experience of the whole planet where you don't see those boundaries and borders which separate people. And I think that this is very important because many of the challenges which we are beginning to recognize today and those with which our children and grandchildren will live every day of their lives are global challenges, global problems the depletion of the, of the ozone layer that protects us from ultraviolet light, the global warming which we are causing, or the, the coming global warming which we are in the process of causing. These things are global in nature and we must deal with them on a global basis. We must work together. And part of what Yuri and I and the other members of the Association of Space Explorers are saying, who have seen this Earth as a single place, is we've got to learn that lesson. It's time that we work together to deal with these global challenges that confront us and to open up new possibilities for the children of the future. And those are the things that we care about. Now, I don't want to say a lot more about that, but I will make just a few extra comments here. Responsible action, whether as individual or as a nation, can no longer be done separately. It is important to act individually in a responsible way, but responsibility today as we're dealing with global issues must come through international cooperation or must incorporate international cooperation and let me give you one dramatic example of that. I recently visited Sweden with a group of people, and we were meeting with the energy ministry of Sweden, Vattenfall. And Vattenfall has a very, very difficult challenge, because in addition to phasing out nuclear power, which has been mandated by the people of Sweden by the year 2020, I believe it is, they also have passed a national restriction in Sweden now against adding any more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere than they currently add. That is, they will, they will not ever increase the rate of emissions of carbon dioxide in Sweden beyond what they are today. That's a very, very responsible action to take. Very glad you applauded. Because there's some counterintuitiveness in that, and it's extremely important. It's entirely possible that manufacturing industries in Sweden will now, as a result 
of the necessary increases in the price of electricity in Sweden will therefore move their manufacturing industries offshore into the third world, developing nations, which do not have the same kind of environmental regulations and standards that exist in many of the developed countries, and certainly not Sweden. And as a result, for one unit of production, there will be something on, which will be cheaper than doing it at home. There will be something on the order of five to ten times more global pollution as a result, strangely, of that unilateral action of Sweden to protect the environment. And so we have some very counterintuitive challenges facing us. We act individually, responsibly, and we create global problems. The only way out of this dilemma is to coordinate our activities internationally, or the environment has no chance. We cannot simply have good environmental standards in the developed world without working with the developing world to establish similar standards. And the next lesson in that is that we will not have the developing world working with us in partnership on environmental standards unless there is economic equity in this world. And so we are going to have to do our part. Now that interactive relationship between economics and environment is similar in the human sphere to the ecological interactions that we see in the environmental, in the biological and physical world. And so as we consider these global problems, we're going to be confronted not just with physical problems of the ozone and things of that kind, but your standard of living and mine and the, way, and, the, and the necessity for us to deal responsibly on a global basis with economic inequity, or we will not have a habitable environment for our grandchildren and beyond. And so that, it seems to me, is a very real challenge. Now, luckily, we have today, for the first time in recent history, a real opportunity. Because through getting to know each other a little bit better, and hopefully by continuing that trend, we may be able to devote more of our resources, both human and capital or physical resources, toward dealing with the challenges that confront us and the opportunities which sit before us. And that's, that today is a unique situation in the world. Hopefully we can shift away from fear and into cooperation to protect this incredibly beautiful planet of ours. So that's part of the hope that I have, and it's part of the hope that's, that's embedded within the Association of Space Explorers and this organization of astronauts and cosmonauts. We hope that everyone will, will join us in urging around this planet of ours, our leaders, our political leaders, to get on with this exciting, and really, truly exciting future to both meet the environmental challenges and open up exploration and understanding of the planet and ourselves and where we live in this universe for our children. Thank you very much and we're going to start questions and answers right now. Um, we'll be Ted Everts, who's the executive director of the Association of Space Explorers, who will also act as a translator for Yuri, who will probably speak mostly in Russian from this point on. Um, I, I think we're going to take uh, questions from the microphones here and also questions that are handed, uh, handed in to whoever it is that's collecting them that are written down. It's been observed that calcium in the body is lost in prolonged space flight. What are the ramifications of that for us and um, for future space flights? Okay, uh, let me repeat that question. Uh, we don't hear too well up here, sorry. Um, the question was that we have we experience calcium loss in long duration spaceflight. What are the implications of that for the future of spaceflight? And I'm going to defer to my companion, Yuri, who's been up there about 100 times longer than me. Конечно, в ходе длительного космического полета человеческий организм претерпевает изменения. Of course, long duration spaceflights do produce certain changes in human organism. 
попадает совершенно новые условия невесомости. И пытается измениться даже на уровне клеток. Меняется состав крови. The composition of blood changes. The uh, ratio of uh, water to salt in the bloodstream is lost. And so calcium and salt are both lost. But we've been uh, taking measures to counteract this. Постоянные тренировки на бегущей дорожке велодвигателя. Constant workout, regular workout on the treadmill and bicycle machine. Ношение специального наклочного костюма. Special weighted pressure suits that we wear on board. Которые нагружают с помощью резиновых тяг, создают как бы искусственную тяжесть в космосе. With the help of sort of rubber material pressing down on the body gives a certain sense of pressure, which is a little bit similar to that of gravity on Earth. And so that these types of measures can help prevent the kind of uh, negative changes that might occur without them in a long-term situation. We've worked this program out pretty well, and it's always used now on all of our long-term the results are very, uh, we're very, we have a lot of confidence in these results. And they've proven themselves to be quite effective. The long-term flight after mine that went for a year with Tito Alpha-Mandarf, uh, they came back and they had absolutely no problems at all. In terms of flights for after Mars, uh, the flight itself to Mars will not be any longer than one year. And so, since Mars has its own gravity, Mars will give our body some ability to rest uh, in a gravity atmosphere once people get there. So, that, uh, when an astronaut or cosmonaut gets to Mars, the Martian gravity will be able to reorient and, like, for however long the people are there, uh, the organism, the human organism, back into its normal mode of being in gravity. And will be ready to take the trip back to Earth. So, I don't think we have any problems. <laughs> you know, spiritual uh, means different things to different people. Uh, to me, the, the personal experience of seeing this planet uh, from, especially when I was outside the spacecraft, uh, I describe it as a, as a spiritual experience, but it, it, it doesn't follow what I would consider to be a sort of classical religious experience. Um, but I... Certainly, as I had five minutes because of a failed camera to simply, I had to, I, I couldn't move because I couldn't, I, let me put it differently. When the camera failed, it was taking photographs of me for documentary purposes, and my companion, Dave Scott, attempted to fix the camera. I had to stay right where I was until he got the camera fixed, or not, as it turned out. But in any case, I had five minutes where I literally had no, nothing to do. And I have said many times that one of the best things in the world that I recommend to people is at least short periods of unemployment. <laughs> in, in that weightless state um, of unemployment in space, uh, I, I literally decided to take that time, whatever it was going to be. Of course, I didn't know it was going to be five minutes, but I knew that there would be a few minutes, and they were mine, I mean, literally, I had nothing else I could do. And so I just, I simply looked at the earth and said, this is my chance to simply be a human being, not an astronaut, not a technician, but to be a human being. Look where you are, Schweikart, 
look, just look, just be here. And in a way, I sort of mentally took off my space suit, I took off my job and my title and everything else, and I was just there in space. Now, that experience was, was very surprising because what happened was immediately the questions came in. How in the world did I get here? What's, what is this and what's going on? And I didn't get any answers. What I did realize was that we, Yuri and I, and, and all of us, in a sense, we're only representatives of people, of the general public, lucky representatives, who have had this experience. But what's happening is the marriage of humanity and technology is now enabling us to move outward from Mother Earth, we are being born into the cosmos, literally. That's what's happening at this moment in history. It's going to have lots of fits and starts, but that's what's going on. And I and it sort of came to me, I realized that that's really what's happening here. And we're going to be our own midwives. There's not somebody else who's going to handle it. It's up to us whether at this moment of cosmic birth, we live through that experience, or we use the technology to wipe ourselves out. And God, uh, your Romanenko, will cosmonauts from other countries other than the Soviet Union be sent to the Mir space station? Да, сейчас мы в центре уже готовятся японские кандидаты космонавты. Yeah, right now we've even got a Japanese candidate who is about to start preparing for a flight. А также закончили подготовку в Великобритании. And in fact, medical uh, checking of a Great Britain, a gentleman in Great Britain, has, uh, has, has been finished, and now they've been invited to Star City, which is, uh, which is the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center, to start on a, on a program for preparation flight. Uh, we have four, actually, four Englishmen. Мы собираемся запустить их в конце следующего года, либо в начале 1991 года. Также у нас уже подготовлено соглашение, в соответствии с которым у нас подготовка в стране и полеты на орбитальные комплексы будут выполнять граждане Испании. And we also have uh, somebody from Spain who is going to be preparing with us and flying up there. Also somebody from uh, another person from uh, the uh, German Democratic Republic. And uh, another uh, cosmonaut from France has expressed his interest in coming to our air station. So we have a lot of international work. Thank you. Let me uh, just jump in with a couple of quick ones here. It said, which planet is expected to be explored in more detail and why? I think uh, we're, we have a lot of discussion going on now about uh, future missions. Clearly Mars is the next planet to be explored. Uh, why? It's a very interesting planet. It happens to be very nearby. That helps as well. Um, but also, uh, Mars is fascinating because at one point in its history, it apparently has had running water on its surface. There's virtually no other way to explain the features that we've now seen on Mars. And one of the questions is, why is the Martian atmosphere as thin as it is, and where has the water gone? We learn a lot about the Earth when we look at other planets, and that's a fascinating planet to look at. Uh, another one here says, after being in space, did your views on politics and human relations change and how? And the answer is yes. Um, how? <laughs> how? Well, let's see. Um, I guess I think politicians should be more responsible than I used to think. Um, of course, all of us uh, said many times during our flights, if only we could bring up uh, the world's political leaders and let them see the Earth from, uh, from that vantage point. Uh, we, we think things might be a lot better, but we don't know. 
Okay, let's take one if there's uh, someone at the microphone in the upper balcony. Let's try that. There isn't one. Come down to the next balcony. Now, try again. How long did it? How long does it take to reach Earth orbit from the launch pad? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry, that's difficult to hear you. Um, of ten minutes from liftoff until insertion into orbit. Uh, but there's some definitional matters. But uh, in the early days with smaller rockets, interestingly, we ex had higher acceleration and it took less time. Now the acceleration is lower, it's more gentle, so it therefore takes a little longer to, before you actually get into orbit. So in the old days, it was six or seven minutes. Now it's 10, 11, 12 minutes. I don't know what it is for Soyuz. Launch to nine minutes. Nine minutes. Mr. Aspects of Current Space Exploration. According to an October 2nd Nation article, the first civil disobedience and a lawsuit coordinated by the Christic Institute will try to halt an October launch of Galileo because it will send aloft enough plutonium and two, generator, two generators to kill every person on Earth. NASA, since the Challenger disaster, estimates the chances of a launch accident at 1 in 78, says the nation. Can either of you gentlemen imagine a more immoral act than launching Galileo? And do you see this as a means by NASA and the Bush administration to create a climate in which people began to accept the deployment of nuclear hardware into space for military purposes? Um, okay, that was as much a statement as a question. Um, I'll take this one since Yuri probably doesn't know much about Galileo. Um, uh, first of all, you, you need to understand that the radioactive thermoelectric generator, the RTG, uh, which is on Galileo, is essentially identical to, I, I don't know the number, but probably 20 or more that have that had been launched uh, before. Uh, this is not a nuclear reactor. Um, the RTG operates totally differently. It's essentially hot metal. Um, it is plutonium, which is radiating heat, and the heat, just from its existence, there's no continuing interaction. There's no circulating fluids or any of that kind of thing. Um, the heat then produces, is used to produce electricity. It's what powered all of the experiments on the moon, and it powered Voyager, which just sent back uh, the final pictures of Neptune on the way out of, uh, out of the solar system. Um, it is true, if you spread all of this around and gave out a minute dose to everybody, that everybody would be damaged. Um, but the whole system is designed in such a way that it will withstand an explosion more severe than that which occurred on the Challenger. Um, there is no zero risk, period, in life. Getting up this morning was a risk. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the system is designed to withstand both a reentry after something like an explosion as well as the force of the explosion itself. Um, so I, I can imagine many things less responsible that I see going on every day to answer your question. As a result of their trip, Yuri, have you had a religious experience? <laughs> no. <laughs> and uh, no one on my cruise did either. <laughs> generally felt by everybody who reads it to be far more poetic um, 
than are the responses from the American astronauts and, and many of the other people. And I, I find that to be true myself. And, and while uh, Yuri and others may not consider them to be religious experiences, in terms of, of a spir of spiritual relationship with the Earth and a sense of awe and wonder, uh, which I think may have been the spirit of the question, uh, I think you'll find it there, and I think Yuri uh, had it as well. Um, let's let me see if there. I, I still haven't found the microphone up there, but it's. Okay. Um, I was wondering, what do you consider to be the most important way to change people's attitudes about the environment? Uh, I'll give you an answer for me while you're thinking. I would, experiential is to me, to me that I knew everything, just about everything about the Earth and what experience I was going to have before I flew. I didn't actually learn a lot new in terms of information or intellectual knowledge. What happened? was an experience in which the reality came into my heart and into my soul, in a sense, not into my head. And that is what that is why experience is so valuable in our lives. Now, how to then give people an experience of their relationship with this environment of ours, which is so important. I wish I had an answer to, but I do believe that one should respect and in some sense seek or open oneself to experiential learning and knowledge as opposed to simply academic knowledge. Yeah, Rusty, I agree with that for sure. Просто добавить, что I want to add. Нужно провести большую работу, как мы говорим, в Советском Союзе с людьми. There you, we've got to do a lot of work with people. Чтобы каждый понял, что на планете, на нашей одной планете мы живем. So that everyone understood that on our one and only planet, все люди любой нации живут как в большом космическом корабле, в нашем родном доме. That we all, people of all the different countries around the Earth, should treat this as if we are living on one spaceship, as we are, we are living on one Earth, our common home. Если каждый поймет, что он действительно живет в этом доме, в своем родном доме, что он хозяин этого дома. If people can get this, if people can become aware that that is indeed how they are living, that is indeed the circumstances of the planet. Тогда нам будет очень просто решить вопрос защиты окружающей среды. Then people will start, hopefully and probably, acting in accordance with that understanding, and it should not really be much of a problem to start. Acting, living responsibly uh, for everyone out here. Um, I'll try a couple of uh, quick questions here. Uh, how much of a problem is space junk for orbiting spacecraft now, and what is the future danger of permanent pollution with space junk, particularly the threat of military pollution? For example, the intentional placement of material in space to hide military targets. What is the best way to protect space from human waste? Um, space junk is, in fact, getting to be a serious issue, more and more serious issue. Uh, it is an example of the kind of technical or quasi-technical activity of the Association of Space Explorers. We not only do things like this, public lectures, but we also uh, promote certain uh, space policies, as it were. Uh, one of them, for example, right now, we are advocating very strongly the commitment to international rescue of astronauts and cosmonauts in distress, similar to the international agreements and conventions which exist at sea. A ship gets in trouble, the nearest ship goes to help, regardless of the flag. We want the same thing in space. Um, now, space junk is another one. One of the things which we must all realize is that space is part of the human environment every bit as much as the atmosphere, the oceans, and the land. We haven't quite understood that yet in the environmental movement, in the environmental consciousness. 
But near space, near Earth space, is part of the human environment and a part which we must protect in the same way. And space junk is a good example. Um, now, there's lots of space junk created both by military and civil activity. And one of the things we have to do is to begin adopting conventions which preclude the spreading of very small bits and pieces, even the size of grains of sand and punctured spacecraft. So that is a problem. Here's a question. While in space, have you ever felt like you did not want to come back home? <laughs> or did you feel like at home already? When you're on a long-term space flight, что ты ощущаешь, что очень соскучился по дому. Of course, the feelings arise that you really do miss home. По друзьям, по земле. Your friends, you miss the earth. Конечно, работа у нас очень интересна. Я люблю свою профессию, свою работу. Of course, we have very interesting work on board the station. I really love my job and my profession. Ну, иногда возникают такие чувства, это, наверное, всем было понятно. But sometimes these kind of feelings arise and you can probably understand why. Ну, а потом подумаешь, вот вернешься ты домой. But then you think about uh, the fact that you are going to be going home. И там навалится столько всяких проблем, которые совершенно не связаны с интересной и любимой работой. And then you know that when you get there, you're going to once again encounter all the many different problems of life that you don't have to deal with when you're doing this wonderfully interesting work on board the station. <laughs> And so then you've got to get the feeling well, maybe you don't want to go. <laughs> the ultimate business trip. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you gentlemen both spent a little bit of time on Sherpa and the technology. One of the things that I'm interested in is an explosion of a different kind that was talked about before the explosion of innovation that will be necessary to get us to Mars. And to actually produce a spacefaring civilization that will do more than just Mars and back again. Is the Soviet program, and have you, uh, Rusty, perhaps, detected uh, in the American program any more attempts than, say, the Office of Exploration, which is at least nice enough to be funding our research group, um, trying to push small groups, innovative technology groups, more than in the past, for a decade at least, there was great difficulty with any small group getting noticed at all. Will Perestroika in the Soviet Union and perhaps the Office of Exploration bring innovation to the fore again in space technology? I'm going to let Yuri answer that first. Ну, я начну отвечать сразу на последний вопрос относительно перестройки. Yeah, in terms of the perestroika part of your question. Во-первых, нам перестройка дает возможность. First of all, perestroika gives us the possibility. Сократить путь от получения очень ценной космической информации до ее потребителя. To shorten the time and the distance between the researchers of space information, people who get the hard data, and the the organizations, institutions, universities, uh, industries that use it in the final house. Right. Before, this was a long, drawn-out, complicated route. And the value of space information kind of disappeared. Secondly, what Perestroika gives us, and that is it, glossiness. Когда сейчас все советские люди знают, каковы у нас расходы на пилотируемый космос, now, какая выгода. All people know in the Soviet Union how much money we're spending on the manned space flight program and what we're getting out of it. И все могут участвовать в одобрении космических программ, либо наоборот в запрещении. And everyone can participate in either the furtherance and the approval of the space program or constraining. Третьих мы, кто связан с космосом. В условиях перестройки стараемся все разработанные новейшие технологические процессы 
Thirdly, so we, what would you do? we who are involved, we cosmonauts and we in the space program who are involved in developing these new technologies that we get from space. Uh, these, these technologies can be used to help the economy. Но на то, что перестройка э, дала возможность участвовать многим э, в разработке космических программ, программ в создании космической техники, так это только хуже. So uh, it's only to the better that Perestroika has enabled us to uh, given us more opportunity to develop our technologies and our space program. Мы учимся э, считать деньги и внимательно рассчитывать каждый свой шаг в космической программе. We're beginning to count money very carefully and we are uh, very careful and, and considerate of just what steps we are going to take. Um, there, are, there are several different uh, aspects to your question, and I'm going to, I, I think, answer a part of it later. I'm going to show just a, another short section of slides, but I'm going to hold that because there's a whole bunch of questions that seem to be related to it. Um, but I will uh, answer your question at this point following way. Um, it, it's certainly true that a great deal of innovation comes from small distributed uh, research centers and businesses. Uh, the mega projects, in some sense, are less creativity oriented. Uh, they're, you know, you've got one big objective and the mega project drives everything in one direction and sometimes creativity is not well respected. The, the problem, of course, is that Unless there are adequate resources to maintain a certain pace in the big project, it becomes very cost ineffective. It becomes, uh, you can go too slow uh, with large projects, and that makes them more costly as well as going too fast. Um, the difficulty that we're having right now is without a reallocation of resources into space research, it's very difficult to keep funding a lot of the small projects without essentially killing the large projects or making them extremely inefficient. Um, so one of the questions that's key to sponsorship of a diversity of creative impulse or creative activity or centers is, in fact, having an adequate budget to do both. And I think we're not at that level, although we're not far below it, actually. Uh, but we do need to have, I think, a rededication of creativity within the civil sector. And I do believe we have that opportunity today. Uh, thank you for the question. I will, in some sense, refer to, again to that later. Uh, balcony time. No one there. Uh, Mr. S uh, Mr. Swagger, uh, both you and Mr. Yamaneko uh, have uh, talked at some length about the need for cooperation in space. The, the fact that when you go in space, you see no borders, that you see the Earth as one planet. And I know with at least concern on my part, the growing use of influence of the military in space. And I see, first of all, space, at least in the past, the military has been a large factor in space exploration. And I'm wondering, from the viewpoint of both yourself um, and also the Association of Space Explorers, how do you feel and how would you respond to those who wish to use space for military purposes? But, uh, let me answer that in, uh, in a way which we wrestled with uh, at the beginning of the formation of the Association of Space Explorers. Uh, there were so many, we started this organization back in 1982 and 83. Uh, those were the days, you may remember, when our president was talking about the Soviet Union as the evil empire. Uh, it was not exactly a hospitable environment to start this organization. Um, we recognize the many differences between our two nations in terms of political systems, uh, uh, worldview, many things. And the same is true with the countries who are members of our association. We have members from 17 countries. Uh, so that the differences, political, ethnic, cultural, language, economic, every other way, I mean, there are tremendous differences. In order then to survive as an organization, we recognize that what we had to deal with was those things which unite us in spite of our differences 
And it's those things which we address and we don't deal with or talk about the political differences or the strategic or military confrontations or problems. We recognize they're there and we wish well to the diplomats and professionals who are dealing with them. We hope that they can rationalize irrational situations. But this is not our field and we all deal with it. I had a question along the same lines, just real quick. What are the, actually, are there any future plans for cooperation between our two nations in space? And if so, what are those? You mean between the U.S. and the USSR? Yeah. Существует сотрудничество между Соединенными Штатами и Советским Союзом по обеспечению аварийной посадки на территории Соединенных Штатов или Советского Союза в случае аварийной армии. Right now we have an agreement between the U.S. and the USSR to aid in the rescue of astronauts and cosmonauts who might fall on each other's territory uh, in the event of an accident or an accidental landing in the wrong place. Отправляясь в полет, каждый экипаж знает на своем языке время включения аварийного включения двигателя и место посадки. Часть таких аварийных точек находится на территории Соединенных Штатов. There are rescue centers in both countries that are prepared to take action in such an eventuality. Это один из прямых примеров нашего сотрудничества. So that's a direct example of how we're cooperating. В дальнейшем мы проведем еще одну встречу, продолжая вот тот экспериментальный полет, который начали в 1975 году. Мы начинаем работу по взаимному спасению в космосе. The Association of Space Explorers has begun to do work, as Rusty mentioned, uh, in the direction of promoting universal space rescue. And this will require special docking mechanisms. will allow the disparate ships from the U.S. and the USSR to dock in space in an emergency situation. In Japan and France as well. <laughs> uh, exploring Mars, people are talking about space stations or bases. I wanted to show just a few slides here in closing which illustrate the kind of thing which is extremely exciting and which I think young people would uh, need to work hard to, to become a part of. And I think they're going to want to. A project that's going on in Arizona right now called the Biosphere Project. I happen to be connected with it and have been for the last five years or so. Uh, this is this is called Biosphere Two. It's a huge um, two and a half acre, totally enclosed um, environment. The the, uh, the arches here, which look like McDonald's, are in fact where the uh, where the intensive agriculture, the food, is going to be produced, and the habitat is not yet visible, but the foundation is in right behind it. And then we have here a rainforest going through a savanna down to a small ocean, and on this end a, a desert environment. This whole thing is this is taken about a month ago now. Um, is very rapidly in construction. The concrete, which you see here, is completely lined on the bottom, but with stainless steel panels, which are welded together in this one structure, so that there is no leakage of water or atmosphere between the biosphere and the surrounding soil. So that you and I live here in biosphere one, the only environment that we know of that supports life. And this is the birth of Biosphere 2, which will be totally separate from Biosphere 1 in a material sense. There will be energy which flows in and out, 
and there will be information which flows in and out of all kinds. But materially, it is completely isolated, or will be completely isolated. Now, how to create, then, a completely self-sustaining environment which will exist for many, many years and support human life is the challenge that these people have taken on themselves. And if you want to talk about innovation and creativity, that's one of the most outrageous um, experiments, projects that's ever been undertaken, and it's being done uh, privately. Now, I'll show you just a few of the slides. And this is Mission Control, you can see behind the Santa Catalina Mountains. This is about 40 miles north of Tucson, Arizona. This is a, a, what's called the test module. All of the construction techniques, the glazing, uh, the sealing of all the glass so that there is no leakage, uh, the sealing and construction of the stainless steel liners and all of that was done on this test module, as well as after it was constructed, putting in many of the plant species that will be used in the main biosphere to sustain life. This is another view of it, and behind it now you see the tall uh, greenhouse which is into which is, are currently being introduced rainforest species from all around the world, from Amazonia, um, as well as from uh, the uh, Central American rainforests. This is another shot looking the other way. Here is the rainforest portion. Here is the intensive agriculture, experimental greenhouses, and aquaculture in here. This is a shot taken from inside the stru uh, structure that is now under construction. And in addition to the structure going up, the first crop of peas have been planted in the, in the intensive agriculture section. Um, about a year from now, eight biospherians of the 14 that you see pictured here. Uh, these aren't astronauts or cosmonauts, but biospherians. And eight of these 14 candidates will, uh, who all of whom, by the way, have been working on this project for a number of years now, so they know each other very well. And um, they will be locked into this closed environment, into Biosphere 2, for a period of two years without coming out and without any exchange between Biosphere 1 and Biosphere 2. So they will live in the first other world, in a sense. Attractive animals. Her name is Gay Allen. Uh, Gay was uh, what was called Specimen Y. Um, specimen X lived in the test module, which was equally closed, it's just a small version, very, very small version compared to the main biosphere. Specimen X lived in, uh, for one day, when it was first closed, uh, specimen Y, Gay Alling here, lived for three days, and uh, in about uh, two weeks now, uh, we'll start up with specimen Z, which I'm not sure who specimen Z is going to be, but they'll be in it for, uh, in the test module, for about two to three weeks. This has never been done before. We have never had a completely enclosed, self-sustaining system, closing both the atmosphere and the water, food, everything else, reprocessing of wastes, the whole thing. It's gay again. This, these, this is in the agricultural, the experimental agricultural greenhouses when some of the different plant species and hybrid were being selected as well as all of the techniques for controlling pests. There's no fertilizers in here, there are no pesticides in here. This is all natural cycling of, of the nutrients and materials. And in order to help, uh, you see tropical species as well. I mean, everything, the, the entire balanced diet has to be internally generated. This is uh, in, the, in the rainforest, the uh, high bay greenhouses. This is uh, one of the other things you asked about other animals. So one of the other things absolutely essential to a great deal of pollination in both agricultural species, but also in, in, 
terms of the natural biomes, uh, the rainforests, the savannas, etc., are insects. And while there will doubtless be insects that have not been invited into the biosphere that are in there, there will also be many that are introduced uh, by design into the biosphere, into biosphere two. And so the insectiary is one of the key research and development uh, laboratories that has been developed at the biosphere. Here you see a friendly tarantula spider. We hope that uh, that as things get larger, they come by invitation only, so that while there may be a cockroach or an ant in there that wasn't invited, we hope there will be no rattlesnakes. Here's one of the invited guests, a pygmy goat. There will be a number of these in there that will both produce milk and consume cellulose, which will be produced in huge quantities. And here you see pygmy pigs, and they're real cute. They're really cute little guys. And here are some of the chickens. These guys were actually rejected. The, these are Rhode Island Reds, and it turned out they were just a little bit too finicky for the environment. And uh, as a result, in the competition with other uh, species, they lost out. Actually, they only partly lost out because it's going to be a hybrid between jungle fowl and Rhode Island Reds that's actually going to go in. Okay, so that's, a, that's an example of one of the very exciting projects that's going on, which is going to lead to the possibility not only of human beings going to visit space, but your children and grandchildren and mine going out there along with goats, pigs, strawberries, and tarantulas to live. And that's if you want something that's going to stimulate young minds, if, it, if you want something that's going to cause people to want to be part of something and not to avoid life and drop into drugs or whatever else there is as an escape at the time, then it's to provide a, an image of the future, a possibility to imagine a future in which people will be living and and having families and doing ballet and other things in this new environment into which humanity is being born, as I said earlier. Now, it's people like this who are taking that challenge seriously and saying, we want to be the private organization. We want to be the experts when it comes to building a community on Mars or under the surface of the moon which is going to not just get McDonald's shipped up from Earth on a resupply ship, but we're going to grow our own food. We're, we're taking with us a whole sample of the wonder and the mystery of life. Not just ordering out, as it were, <laughs> which is what we've done up to this point. And so I see this as one of the most powerful tools not only to extend the environment of humanity and of life, off this planet, but also to give our children and the children of the world something really worth living for and reaching for and stretching. And in that, I invite you to join Yuri and I and all of the rest. So thank you very much for the wonderful evening.